Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante, and uh, we're live here at IBM IOD, IBM's big data conference. Think big is the theme of this conference. Uh, play it off of Thomas Watson's Think, the most famous mantra in the history of the computer industry, and IBM has taken that to new levels. IBM's great job with branding, you know, smarter computing, and always really does a good job from you know, the, the big picture perspective. But uh, this event has really evolved from kind of a boring, stodgy information management uh, perspective, really to you know, big data and really instrumenting uh, uh, organizations, industries, and bringing in a whole new perspective. IBM showing its innovation, showing off its technology, its people, its visions. And IBM this year chose to bring in Jason Silva. Jason Silva is a TV personality, uh, he's a very interesting individual, and he's hosting this event, and it's our pleasure, Jeff Kelly and, my, and myself, uh, my co-host, our pleasure to have Jason on theCUBE, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. It's really uh, nice to be here with you. Yeah, we're humbled. You're a filmmaker. We've got our little little cute <laughs> yeah, setup Yeah, no, I love here. the setup it's, you got going on. It's, it's pretty great, mobile, man. you it's, know. I love uh, it, But man. it works, and we're streaming live. Been doing this now for a couple of years. Fabulous. And, uh, and we were early to the game, so I saw your keynote. It was quite amazing. Oh, good. Um, Glad you enjoyed fantastic. it. I was uh, off to the side. The band was playing very, very high energy. I tweeted, I wouldn't want to follow this gentleman. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's so funny. I'm I've gonna, heard that before, actually. I'm just going <laughs> to push the button on the back and say go, but <laughs> <laughs> just so. So you had this incredible stream of big data consciousness uh, yeah. for the audience. I mean, that was your yeah. job. It was to yeah. pump us up, sure. it was to set the tone. Um, yeah. You covered more ground in that first 20, 30 minutes than I think <laughs> I've ever seen on the topic. So I appreciate maybe you that. Could, um, maybe you could tell us, let me start with, what have you learned this week? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because um, there's a great line by Tom Robbins. He says, you cannot manufacture imagination or wonderment, but what you can do is pull people out of context in such a dramatic manner that you force them to gawk in amazement at these ubiquitous everyday wonders that we're somehow culturally disposed to ignore. And I think that my function in the opening talk was to provide people with that long view, that out of context aerial perspective so that they can see how the world is changing and how big data is a big part of that. I mean, some consumers often fear the idea of big data because they're worried that companies are going to know all this information about them and people don't like the idea of being reduced to algorithmic cascades, to quote Eric Davis. But I actually think that it's really interesting to be able to understand ourselves as algorithmic cascades. Like we can all be translated into algorithms and I think that's fascinating. I think the fact that we have now, we're extending sensors into everything and we can measure more than we've ever been able to measure and we have the computing power to be able to extrapolate meaning from everything that we can measure and provide, turn this, turn this data into these rich visualizations that provide intuitive insight into something that's composed of like vast swaths of data. I think it, it becomes an instrument of mind expansion. And so my message, you know, it, it has this kind of slightly psychedelic perspective <laughs> because it, it's trying to give you a, a, a phase change in consciousness. So it's not just like bottom line, how we can use this to make our businesses run more efficiently. That's also cool, but it's more like, look at how this like enlarges the way we can understand ourselves. We, we always need a story. The human, mm -hmm. the human, the human, the human technology co-evolving sort of civilization always needs a story to understand itself. And I think that what big data does is just, it provides better and better context for understanding what it is to be human in the 21st century. What we like, where we go, what we do, where we go, what we, everything that we do is now just being quantified, and I don't know, it's, I, just, I just find it fascinating. It's interesting to Sorry hear Sorry to you. rant. No, it's great. I, I, okay. Like I said, I'm going to push the button and you're going to go, so this is great. <laughs> great. Exactly. It's easy. But it's interesting to hear you talk about, you're basically embracing the algorithmic instrumentation of your, your life. You think it's a generational divide? Do you think mm. that, um, that, that people of your generation uh, are actually excited about that and people of perhaps my generation are a little fearful of that or, or no? Well, no, I think that technology, just like, just like language, uh, the emergence of language, it allowed us to process greater amounts of information mm -hmm. and transmit greater amounts of information. And you know, just like when you look through a through a telescope or through a microscope and you're immediately privy to this whole entire universe of stimuli coming into the senses, I think that this is the way we need to see big data. It's like mm -hmm. we're putting on a pair of lenses and all of a sudden we're just seeing how everything really works, you know? And, and what also blows my mind is that even though we're using more and more technology to measure more and more things, what we're learning through these measurements is that these 
patterns keep recurring, and these are patterns that we also found, find in natural systems. So now man-made systems are closing the loop. We're learning that cities operate like organisms, that alleys are like capillaries, <laughs> that the information sharing systems that comprise the internet look like neurons in the brain, that forager ants, when they hunt for food, mirror the information traffic flows of TCP IP patterns on the internet. So it's like, I'm interested in that because first of all, it, it elicits a sense of wonder in people and perhaps instead of making them so like afraid of what these increasingly powerful, powerful tools um, do to, to, the, to, to the human civilization, um, I think it makes people be like, oh wow, this is interesting. How can we do this to make our, our world run better? Like, you know what I'm, do you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, so let me ask you a question. When, when, when did you start thinking about big data? Was it even called big data when you started thinking about it? Uh, I did a video called well, I did, for the last year, I've been doing a series of micro documentaries that I call Shots of Philosophical Espresso <laughs> because they're meant to, they're, they're, they're using their, their content that's formatted for an ADD generation, and a generation that's saturated in content and attention is the new limited resource. And in order to engage people, you can't feel entitled to their time because they got all, you're competing with a thousand other websites that are open and Twitter and Facebook. And so I started doing a series of short micro docs. They're two minutes in size that explore a lot of these big ideas. I, and so I did one of the videos was called To Understand is to Perceive Patterns. And that's like my big data video. And it's, of course, that's a line by Isaiah Berlin. To understand is to perceive patterns. So basically it's this notion that the more we can connect the dots, the better tools that we have that allow us to see new patterns, the more understanding we have of the world and of ourselves and of the the system of the human machine system, right? And so that video was inspired from an article I read in a website called Reality Sandwich, which was the one that, that looked at this notion of, well, first of all, they said that um, Google was the first psychedelically informed superpower <laughs> and that its vision of super connectivity and super conductivity is reflects or was the hallmark of the whole psychedelic vision that everything is connected. And you know, Timothy Leary, Marshall McLuhan, these guys used to say computers are the LSD of the 90s in the sense that they are instruments of mind expansion. And Steve and Jobs it, took that literally. And if you ever read <laughs> the book What the Dormouse Said by New York Times writer John Markoff, this is a book of the real sort of coming together of the counterculture in the 60s and the technology mm -hmm. room in movement in Silicon Valley and how Xerox sure. Park and Douglas Engelbart were obsessed with like augmenting human intelligence and a lot of the engineers were given LSD and all of a sudden computers were reconceived as tools for personal liberation and for mind extension and mind expansion. And so I sort of take that, that angle, they call it the cyberdelic perspective, which is sees the, and, and, and so I made this video to understand and to perceive patterns, which showcases that you know, what they call big data and everything that we're realizing is there's all these like patterns of connection, what Gregory Bateson calls the pattern that connects. And, uh, and hopefully the video for people is a, is a mind expanding experience that at the same time they come out of that thinking, wow, technology is interesting and it can lead to a, a, a sort of mental transcendence and a tr <laughs> transcending of our mental limits and decondition our thinking and make us understand things in a new way. And so that's like my sort of agenda, you, you might yeah, say. Yeah, so it's very inspirational. Talk about some of the things that have um, really excited you in terms of specifically how this information flow, this new vision that you're putting forth yeah. is changing people's lives. Um, what well, one of the you really interesting that. things, there was, a, there was an article by Bill Clinton in Time Magazine called A Case for Optimism, published recently when he did this last mm -hmm. Clinton Global Initiative. Mm -hmm. And um, the first section of the article was, was called Phones Equal Freedom. Mm -hmm. And he says, forget about this idea of the info haves and the info nots. Uh, he says that the cell phone, according to the 2010 United Nations study, was one of the greatest inventions in history to pull people out of poverty. So it's this idea that you know technology, yes, at first the greatest technology is expensive, and yes, at first it doesn't work very well, but eventually it trickles down. At an exponential rate, it gets increasingly cheaper, more affordable, more ubiquitous, and better. And we got the penetration of six billion cell phones. So now these cell phones are allowing people to have things like um, mobile banking, you know, in places like Africa and Haiti, mobile health, where they're sending health information through the use mm -hmm. of these cell phones. A young person in Africa today has better communications technology than the U.S. president had 25 years ago. So consider you know, the tools to change the world are in everybody's hands. The supercomputers of yesteryear are in everybody's hands. You know, the futurist Ray Kurzweil 
likes to say, and this is fascinating, um, the cell phone in your pocket, the smartphone in your pocket is a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful than a $60 million supercomputer that was half a building in size 40 years ago in Stanford. So when you consider the rate of change, when you consider the rate of that progress, and that's in everybody's hands, so now everything that, every, everything that we do is being measured, and you know, everything, every action, everything we like, we don't like, everything we tweet is being quantified, and it's being fed back into the system, mm -hmm. increasingly, you know, we've always been good, human beings have always been good at dovetailing our minds to our tools. But when our tools start dovetailing back, when that feedback loop, when the smart systems just get smarter and smarter, all of a sudden the division between user and tool becomes very flimsy. Andy Clark from, wrote a book called Natural Born Cyborgs. He's a cognitive philosopher. He says we need to get over our skin bag bias and see <laughs> these tools for what they are part of the human technology co-evolution, part of our extended mind, our outsourced cognition. And the, you know, that, that out of perspective view of it starts to, makes us realize that we're all part of this like kind of co-evolving system that feeds on itself. So and yesterday, John Furrier, one of our other guests years ago on theCUBE said that you know, everything that was, uh, has been invented in, uh, in technology actually came from Star Trek. And, and then we added to that yesterday the matrix. So you <laughs> described that. <laughs> totally. But what you're saying about the case for optimism and essentially the digital, digital divide was kind of, you know, I always thought it was kind of BS because it would eventually, you know, yeah. raise all ships. But do you, how do you feel about privacy? Same thing? I mean, there is no privacy on the web and, and, and there's, there's more value to get out of sharing where you are, you know, your location, geospatial and the like, than there is, you know, a threat? Well, look, I think that there's always uh, growing pains or as we transition to a very different world because of technology there there's na there, it's natural for people to have a little bit of resistance you know there was there was resistance when we invented writing you know i think <laughs> i think i read that even socrates used to say that he was opposed to writing things down this technology of writing because we wouldn't have to remember anything if we wrote it down and our brains would atrophy and you know there was fears about the telegraph and the telephone and the radio and so i think that now you know these concerns that are brought up are good it's part of the the, the system talking to itself it's a self correcting system or do we want this do we like this do we not like this but i think that the exponential progress of technology is inexorable i was actually reading an article today written by Matt Ridley, who wrote a book called The Rational Optimist. And he was talking about Moore's Law and the exponential growth curves of tech and how, first of all, that's now eating up uh, biology. You know, biology is becoming an information technology. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, actually, um, well, I totally blanked out. <laughs> but no, um, the gene sequencing rate is going three times faster than Moore's Law. And one of the things that he's saying is that We've had globally, this exponential growth curve hasn't been affected by economic slumps, by world wars, by policy changes. It doesn't change, so it's kind of reassuring that even though you know, sometimes we're discouraged because our politicians don't seem to be thinking exponentially at all, he says that the, 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 the human technology organism keeps these exponential growth curves no matter what. So yes, these privacy concerns, we can talk about them, we can address them. I think if somebody wants to turn off some function on their phone because they don't want to tell people what website they're browsing, that's totally fine, but it's not going to stop these, these growth curves. So, you know what I mean? Like, these are small yeah, concerns I mean, along the way. I'm more interested, again, in what does this mean for the future? How are we going to enlarge our sphere of possibilities? Mm -hmm. Well, Scott McNeely said in the Cube, there is no privacy in the internet, get over it. <laughs> right, so, <laughs> you know, you're talking about bringing kind of man and machine together, and that yeah. is kind of, for, some, for a lot of people, that's like science fiction, and totally. kind of, kind of uh, you know, it's a scary thought where yeah. the machines are going to be making decisions for me, and what if, what if they, you know, they, they, they create a, a mind of their own, and, and yeah. we can't control them, that kind of, that kind of thing, so how yeah. do we balance that? I mean, where does human, uh, the human element still come in when we've got smart systems telling us what to do, when to do it, the <laughs> best way to do it, the most efficient way to do it? Well, look, I think that uh, everything is changing. I think that if you were to talk, if you were, if you were to try to communicate to early hominids pre the emergence of language, what the world post language would have been like, it would have been just impossible for them to like, fitted in their consciousness, you know, a world of cathedrals and eventually jet engines and cell phones and <laughs> minds connecting to other minds, <laughs> transcending the limitations of time, space, and distance. I mean, that sounds godlike even to our ancestors of 200 years ago, but imagine to like pre-language, I mean, trying to teach, a, a, you know, an ape the subtleties of Shakespearean poetry, you know, you can't really teach that to a, <laughs> to a chimp or an orangutan or a dog, you know, so it's like, 
I think that with technology, if we keep augmenting our capacities, we're already outsourcing our cognition and our memory to these extended minds. But in the next 25 years, when the cell phone that was 60 million bucks you know, became pocket size in 25 years, that'll be blood cell size. When our computers are in our brains, the symbiosis will be complete. You know, and at that point, yes, it's difficult what to consider what that might be like and whether it's more us or more the computer, but I think that whole distinction is the cognitive leap that we need to take. Those computers are us. We live inside of condensations of our imagination, as Terence McKenna says. Like, we already live in our minds, you know? Mm -hmm. Everything that we see, when we're flying on a plane through the air, we're flying inside of an outgrowth of the human brain. When you look at the topography of Manhattan, that topography is a topography in which the forces of economics and culture and human intent have trumped geology. The shape of Manhattan today is no longer shaped by geology, it's shaped by the decisions of the mind on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> if you could see human progress as if through time lapse, you would see that literally our thoughts spill over into the world and, and erect and shape matter. Mm -hmm. And so you look at exponential growth and you look into the future, I mean, that's mind over matter, but who's not to say that that might, that might not be the fate of the whole universe. Gravitation and antimatter govern the, wor the universe at its earliest and least inter interesting stages, but eventually the whole entire thing will be subject to the intent of substrate independent, infinitely more powerful minds. Computation operate, you know, trillions of times more powerful computation, more concentrated, operating maybe at femtoscale. I mean, even today, Kevin Kelly says that there's more energy per second per gram going through a microchip than anything else that we know in the universe in terms of energy per second per gram. So you see this co compression of energy happening and this complexification. And so where is that going? I don't know, but it's fun to think about. <laughs> yeah, it hurts sometimes to think about. So um, what do you tell young people? Um, I tell you young people young. to be excited, yeah. man. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I like the, the term, Carl Sagan coined the term wonder junkie in the book Contact, and I think that wonder and awe is sort of an antidote to existential despair. I think experiences that push you beyond your perceptual boundaries, rewire your mental maps of what is possible, are invigorating, and they provide a sort of antidote to existential stupor, or to the idea that, like, everything ends in death, and, like, you know, we're only here for a second, and whereas everything is defined by impermanence. But I think when we can enlarge our view and see the big picture, we see this inexorable move towards complexity. I don't know where that takes us, but hopefully beyond the infinite, man as they say in 2001. <laughs> so what kind of projects are you working on uh, these days? I mean, you mentioned your little... Yeah, so I started, I used to work for Al Gore's TV channel, Current mm -hmm. TV, I hosted yep. a show there for four right. years, but then I, I left and I wanted to create my own content on the web. I felt like online video had become ubiquitous enough that people didn't roll their eyes at you if you were making your own content <laughs> on the web. So I started doing <laughs> a series of short films and I just put them online, they're non-commercial kind of mashups, like I was saying, and they kind of went viral. My, my Vimeo channel has like, you know, 1.5 million views at this point. And so I started getting invited to all these cool conferences, like I spoke at TED Global, and, uh, and I have spoke at, you know, the Economist Ideas Conference, and DLD, and keynote events for Microsoft, and now this IBM one. So it's just, I, I'm being brought in to provide kind of a, a different take on what is happening. You know, it's, it's always been the role of the artist to sniff out environmental change, to realize that the future is the present, and then use his art to prepare the grounds for it. This is Marshall McLuhan's words. Mm -hmm. And so I'm that, I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm the artist. I'm not a scientist or a technologist, but I, I come at this and I'm like, this is how I see it from the end part. Just, and I'm creating work that hopefully pulls people out of context and makes them look at things in a new way. And most recently, National Geographic um, actually approached me to host a show for them about the human brain. So it's called Brain Games and we're in production now. And that comes out uh, in the spring. So look out for that. And you know, I'm always, uh, I'm always publishing uh, text, articles on blogs, and making more videos, and, uh, and I'm on Twitter. I'm at Jason Silva, if you want to connect and uh, stay in touch. And uh, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I've been busy. Fantastic, do that. I love the fact that you know, IBM, companies like <laughs> IBM, Microsoft, bring somebody with your vision, your energy, uh, into their world uh, to share with their customers, <laughs> right? Well, I, this is the thing, man. It's just like we, 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 we're so quick to, you know, there's a great line, I think it's Woodsworth channeling Coleridge. He says, the challenge in life is to awaken the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom and the film of familiarity and redirecting it instead to the wonders of existence. We already live in a world of wonders. We already live in a world where a machine with a million moving parts flies through the air in perfect precision, where a, where a, a device made of plastic and metal and you press a few buttons on glass, on a glass surface. You know, you, not even buttons, you just rub <laughs> your fingers on a glass 
glass surface and send your thoughts traveling through time and space. Amber Case, the cyber anthropologist, says it's technology-enabled telepathy. It really is. We are telepathic beings. In conjunction, in our marriage with our technology, we can now send our thoughts through time and space, electrified thoughts traveling at the speed of light. We already live in that world. I'm just taking what already is, and then I'm looking into the future. I'm extrapolating, and we know that Moore's Law is consistent. We know it goes even faster when, with gene sequencing, mm -hmm. and with nanotechnology, matter itself becomes a programmable medium. Those three overlapping revolutions, artificial intelligence, the domestication of biotechnology, and the domestication of matter with nanotech, you put those three things together, man, and, you know, having invented the gods, we can turn into them. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe even attack that speed of light problem. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Jason, well, thank you very much for thank coming Thank you on guys, the man. Really what a pleasure. Having you. Thank you. Great, Great talking to you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Keep it right there. We're right back with our cool. next guest. We're live. This is theCUBE from IOD. Keep it right there.